Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. But first, I'd like to, it's very rare that we see all the people in the research offices and all the people who do the fantastic work behind the scene here, what I call the unknown soldiers. So it's an opportunity to thank you all for all the work that you do <clears throat> to, to support us, our students, and make our work possible. So I'm here to talk about a little bit, just give my reflections and experience in, about EXAF and why I believe it's an important initiative that has a lot of potential of making the difference, not only in Africa, but Switzerland and around the world. So I can... But to, to, since I'll talk about the project, I'll just take a few, uh, few seconds to ex put the contents and explain what we do in my lab. My lab is interested in neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and Huntington disease, and how we can understand the causes of these diseases and develop new therapies and diagnostics for these disorders. The way we typically approach these diseases is through understanding the diseases from, on, with insight from the patients. So typically what we do in my lab, we try to look at the brains of patients who are post-mortem after they die, but we also collect a lot of biological fluids in terms of from the CSF, from the blood, and now soon skin biopsies and colon biopsies to try to understand what changes usually happen in the patients that are different from the human. And then we use this information in the lab to develop animal models of different aspects of the disease. This information is then used to, to gain insight into the mechanism, identify new therapeutic targets and therapies, and develop molecules that we can use to diagnose the disease either in the brain or in peripheral fluid. So why should people like us get involved in projects like this with Africa? And here I try to hydrolyze this. And first and foremost is because today we don't have any effective therapies for these diseases, which means if we in the Western world were smart enough, we would have solved this problem. And in order to solve this problem, we need diversity of people, diversity of ideas, and the best breakthrough may actually come from somewhere else. Many of the genetics of the diseases we work on were also discovered in areas that has no research on them. And many of the new mechanistic insight is coming from us studying population in areas where there is no research infrastructure. So I believe, as I will try to show you today, that these collaborations with Africa, but also under other, other underdeveloped countries, provide unique scientific opportunities to do type of work and research that actually cannot be done in Switzerland or in the Western world, and therefore offers unique opportunities for us as scientists to make new breakthroughs and have a competitive edge. As I said, another important aspect for us is to promote diversity and inclusion in neurodegenerative diseases. What I mean by that, in addition to diversity of ideas, we need diversity of people. So it turns out that most of our understanding of human diseases comes from studying Western and Asian population. And therefore, we're missing a huge you know, insight into these diseases in other ethnic groups. And, and, and studying these ethnic groups could actually provide novel insight to these diseases. I also believe that there is a lot of talent in these countries in Africa. And I think if, in order to realize this, you only have to walk around the campus and look at the people who come from North Africa and elsewhere. And as a person who comes from a poor country, I also feel there is a sense of obligation to give back and contribute to these. So I see initiatives like Excellence in Africa as a win-win initiative for all. So what distinguishes this from others? That you know, there are a lot of programs that try to build links between Switzerland and develop, you know, developing countries and others. But these are, in my opinion, sort of what distinguishes this program. First, it's highly selective. In other words, the selection is already done so that you get to collaborate with people who have you know, very solid scientific skills and have a lot of commitment to, to research, to their career, to the project. So since this is already done through the XSAP staff, it makes our job a lot easier. Again, there is a lot of programs that provide support to make these links, but usually the financial resources are 
are barely can allow you to just start the program, and then you do nothing. And some of the programs we have are 15,000, 20,000 for a project that can barely cover anything. XSAF provides generous resources, so we say there is 720,000, so it allows you to really embark and research projects that are, you know, that could have a true scientific impact and, and where, you know, where you could accomplish significant things. Uh, the project supports quite a lot of travel and research exchange. We've had four visits between my lab and my collaborators in, in Tunisia, and this is crucial because it facilitates and accelerates the transfer of know-how, which means you can do more research at the other end, and that's, again, and, and opens new scientific opportunities. For us also, another very important is, is really the dynamic, committed, and active engagement of the leadership of XSAF and staff. When you have to work with some of these countries, there are a lot of rules, there are a lot of things that are difficult and logistics to handle these collaborations. And we've had tremendous report, support from the XSAF team in terms of lifting that responsibility and allowing us to focus on research. So why Tunisia and Egypt for me? Again, for the, for the same reasons that I have mentioned before, you know, I've interacted with people in these countries over the past 15 years, and, and we have not been able to, to get the resources to do something this significant, and, and XSAF allows us to do this. But as I said, you know, these things can only work if they're win-win. If they're not win-win, they're not sustainable. And we're interested, I am interested in looking at neurodegenerative diseases within the MENA population, the Arab population in the MENA region or the MENA population in the MENA region, because there, there, one, there are specific questions that we cannot address here. For example, we're interested in the role of pesticides in Parkinson's disease. We don't, pest, you don't use pesticides in, in Switzerland. So, that mechanistic aspect can only be studied today in, in some countries, including Egypt, and that's why we work with Egypt. There are, in many of these countries, there is a high degree of consanguinity. So genetic diseases sometimes are more prevalent. So if you want to understand the genetic causes of diseases, these populations are a treasure box. For example, as I will show you in Tunisia, we have one type of a genetic mutation that is linked to Parkinson's disease. It usually is present in about 10% of Western population. It's more than 40% in Tunisian population. So if we want to make a study in these population, we cannot find this cohort anywhere else. And if you have access to this cohort, you have access to something that nobody has. And another key that I think is, is crucial for us is here proximity. Tunisia is only two hours away. So it's very easy to go. It's very easy. We're in the same time zone. So, uh, you know, all of these elements ensure that not only that you have a productive, but you have also a sustainable collaboration. So I have involved in two programs. One is the junior faculty, which is a fantastic collaboration with a talented Tunisian uh, neuroscientist, Inas. And this project is, is very simple. It's a classical example. It's basically based on the idea of extracting bioactive molecules from venoms, snake venoms, scorpion venoms, and exploring their therapeutic potential as drugs for Parkinson's disease. Now these, you know, animals are sort of dangerous, but inside their venom there is quite a lot of bioactive molecules that sometimes when injected are toxic, but when digested are beneficial. And some of them have actually made it as drugs. But in the past, there's been very difficulties in translating things we isolate from the venom of these animals to drugs because of the lack of expertise in handling and separating these molecules. This is what this group, Inath and her group at the Institute Pasteur have been doing for years. They've developed unique expertise and to basically take these venoms, separate the different molecules in these venoms, many of which act on the central nervous system, and now what we do in our lab is we take all our expertise in Parkinson's disease and all the models we have developed, and we test the potential of these molecules in our models. For, so we have different animal models of Parkinson's disease and neurodegenerative diseases. We have processes that are associated with the disease, and then we basically try to determine whether any of these molecules could actually block the disease-causing process in animals. And I'm happy to, to, so we've had 
quite a lot of uh, four visits the, 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 from the team in, to, in Tunisia. And this is an example of a recent data. Actually, the best neuroprotective compound that we have tested in our lab have come from these compounds. So there is quite a lot of excitement. We presented this the other day, and two companies came to approach us. I don't mention the compound because we plan to patent this. So the idea these are not just volunteer efforts. There is a lot of scientific and exciting opportunities that one can seize. The second project that we are involved in is a project to the PhD students with Shema here at the University of Cairo. And I've known Shema's boss for a number of years, Mohammed Salama, and we've tried to collaborate. And I think the catalyst and the glue is always sometimes the funding. And basically what they're trying to do here is to build their infrastructure for doing sort of diagnostic and biomarker discovery in, 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 in Egypt and to try to see whether there are specific aspects of the disease that are unique to the Egyptian population. So the project is basically they are building, recruiting patients who have dementia and neurodegenerative diseases and they plan to collect samples from them these samples, some of them will be shared with us, and what we're doing here is we're training Shema on the different methods and assays to study these molecules and, and help them build this infrastructure. So I said, you know, this, these collaborations have led to new opportunities. Frederick talked about this visit, but perhaps one of the important things that came out of this visit is a collaboration that started in neuroscience is now potentially expanding to infectious disease and cancer. And at the end of the meeting, the head of the Pasteur Institute in Tunisia proposed that they would initiate funding mechanism from them to support collaborative project between EPFL and Institute Pasteur. So this has also helped us begin for my project to go beyond the work with INAS to build a community within Tunis to expand to build a research community in Parkinson's disease we just got ethical approval to start up to a project with Samia Bin Sassi on this LARC2 LARC cohort, and we're organizing a, a workshop on a conference next year in Alzheimer's disease with Professor Riyadh in, in, in this. And this is just a project on these type, these LARC2 patient that I was started. One of her PhD students already spent three months in the lab, learned all the technique. We have now all the samples in the lab and no one else in the world has access to these samples today. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and opportunity to share these thoughts with you. Thank you.